Previously, the Trojan War. On the Greek side with Achilles gone, the two greatest champions were Ajax and Diomedes. They fought gloriously that day and many a Trojan lay on his face in the dust before them. The, the bloodstained murderous god of war was fighting for Hector. At the sight, Diomedes shuddered and cried to the Greeks to fall back slowly. With Ares gone, however, the Trojans were forced to fall back at this crisis. A brother of Hector's, wise in discerning the will of the gods, urged Hector to go with all speed to the city and tell the queen, his mother, to offer to Athena most beautiful robe she owned and pray her to have mercy. The Trojan War More than a thousand years before Christ, near the eastern end of the Mediterranean, was a great city, very rich and powerful, second to none on earth. The name of it was Troy, and even today, no city is more famous. The cause of this long-lasting fame was a war told in one of the world's greatest poems. The Iliad. Queen Hecuba took a robe so precious that it shone like a star, and laying it to the goddess's knees, she besought her. Lady Athena, spare the city and the wives of the Trojans and the little children. But Pallas Athena denied the prayer. As Hector went back to the battle, he turned aside to see once more, perhaps for the last time, the wife he tenderly loved, Andromache and his son, Astyanax. He met her on the wall where she had gone in terror to watch the fighting when she heard the Trojans were in retreat. With her was a handmaid carrying the little boy. Hector smiled and looked at them silently, but Andromache took his hand in hers and wept. My dear lord, she said, you who are father and mother and brother unto me, as well as husband, stay here with us. Do not make me a widow and your child an orphan. He refused her gently. He could not be a coward, he said. It was for him to fight always in the forefront of the battle. Yet she could know that he never forgot what her anguish would be when he died. That was the thought that troubled him above all else, more than his many other cares. He turned to leave her, but first he held out his arms to his son. Terrified, the little boy shrank back, afraid of the helmet and its Fears nodding crest. Hector laughed and took the shining helmet from his head. Then, holding the child in his arms, he caressed him and prayed, O oh Zeus, in after years may men say of this, my son, when he returns from battle. Far greater is he than his father was. So he laid the boy in his wife's arms, and she took him, smiling yet with tears. her and touched her tenderly with his hand and spoke to her. Dear one, be not sorrowful. That which is fated must come to pass, but against my fate no man can kill me. Then taking up his helmet, he left her and she went to her house, 
often looking back at him and weeping bitterly. Once again on the battlefield, he was eager to fight and better fortune for a time lay before him. Zeus had by now remembered his promise to Thetis to avenge Achilles' wrong. He ordered all the other immortals to stay in Olympus. He himself went down to earth to help the Trojans. And it went hard with the Greeks. Their great champion was far away. Achilles sat alone in his tent, brooding over his wrongs. The great Trojan champion had never before shown himself so brilliant and so brave. Hector seemed irresistible, tamer of horses, the Trojans always called him, and he drove his car through the Greek ranks as if the same spirit animated steeds and driver. His glancing helm was everywhere, and one gallant warrior after another fell beneath his terrible bronze spear. When evening ended the battle, the Trojans had driven the Greeks back almost to their ships. There was rejoicing in Troy that night, but grief and despair in the Greek camp. Agamemnon himself was all for giving up and sailing back to Greece. Nestor, however, who was the oldest among the chieftains and therefore the wisest, wiser even than the shrewd Odysseus, spoke out boldly and told Agamemnon that if he had not angered Achilles, they would not have been defeated. Try to find some way of appeasing him, he said. Instead of going home disgraced, all applauded the advice and Agamemnon confessed that he had acted like a fool. He would send Briseis back, he promised him, and with her many other splendid gifts, and he begged Odysseus to take his offer to Achilles. Odysseus and the two chieftains chosen to accompany him found the hero with his friend Patroclus, who of all men on earth was dearest to him. Achilles welcomed them courteously and set food and drink before them. But when they told him why they had come and all the rich gifts that would be his if he would yield, and begged him to have pity on his hard-pressed countrymen, they received an absolute refusal. Not all the pleasures of Egypt could buy him, he told them. He was sailing home and they would be wise to do the same. But all rejected that counsel when Odysseus brought back the answer. The next day they went into battle with the desperate courage of brave men cornered. Again they were driven back until they stood fighting in the beach where their ships were drawn up. But help was at hand. Hera had laid her plans. She saw Zeus sitting on Mount Ida watching the Trojans conquer and she thought how she detested him. But she knew well that she could get the better of him only in one way. She must go to him looking so lovely that she could not resist her. When he took her in his arms, she would pour sweet sleep upon him and he would forget the Trojans. So she did. She went to her chamber and used every art she knew to make herself beautiful beyond compare. Last of all, she borrowed Aphrodite's girdle, wherein were all her enchantments, and with this added charm, she appeared before Zeus. As he saw her, love overcame his heart so that he thought no more of his promise to Thetis. At once, the battle turned in favor of the Greeks. Ajax hurled Hector to the ground, although before he could wound him, Aeneas lifted him and bore him away. With Hector gone, the Greeks were able to drive the Trojans far back from the ships and Troy might have been sacked that very day, if Zeus had not awakened. He leaped up and saw the Trojans in flight and Hector lying gasping in the plain. All was clear to him and he turned fiercely to Hera. This was her doing, he said, her crafty crooked ways. He was half-minded to give her then and there a beating. When it came to that kind of fighting, Hera knew she was helpless. She promptly denied that she had had anything to do with the Trojans' defeat. It was all Poseidon, she said, and indeed the sea god had been helping the Greeks contrary to Zeus's orders, but only because she had begged him. However, Zeus was glad enough of an excuse not to lay hands on her. He sent her back to Olympus and summoned Iris, the rainbow messenger, 
to carry his command to Poseidon to withdraw from the field. Sullenly, the sea god obeyed and once more the tide of battle turned against the Greeks. Thank you.